All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, my name is Stu McKenzie. I serve as Science Manager for the Criminal Investigations and Network Analysis, or CNA Center, here at George Mason. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this latest in a series of talks that explores CNA's research topics, which, broadly speaking, include um, developing a wide range of analytic uh, tools and insights for federal investigators to help in their fight against organized crime. Um, those of you who share our interest in these topics may like to join us on December 5th when we'll have uh, Dr. David Maimon from Georgia State University for a talk on uh, evidence-based cybersecurity. Uh, we've also got a very rich program of spring events planned for you, uh, which will include talks on uh, mass shootings, on human trafficking, uh, and also on dynamic mapping of, of uh, drug flow routes from the southern to the northern United States. Um, to stay on top of these and other upcoming events, please don't forget to sign in using the sheet. Uh, folks joining us remotely this afternoon, please shoot us an email. We'll be very happy to make sure that you're posted about these and other upcoming events. Uh, without further ado, it's a great pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker for this afternoon, Dr. Thomas Holt. Um, Tom did his PhD at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. He currently serves as a professor of criminal justice at Michigan State University. Uh, Tom's leading a very impressive team of interdisciplinary researchers on a CENA-funded initiative to look at the size, the structure, and the characteristic, uh, characteristics of uh, criminal marketplaces on the dark web. Uh, I also recently learned that Tom's working with our sister center at Arizona State uh, on a project that examines ideologically motivated um, uh, cyber attacks on U.S. criminal uh, critical infrastructure mm -hmm. as well. Um, he's going to talk to us a little bit this afternoon about some of his uh, research findings. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Tom Holt. Thank you, everyone. It's good to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. As was mentioned, we've had this project now for about the last two years, trying to scope out the size and the dynamics of the online market for various types of products. And that's kind of an important question because over the last few uh, well, really over the last decade, there's been a fair amount of research considering how markets work. So most of the market research that's been done has focused either in two areas. One is around the sort of cybercrime as service community. So that's where any individual can buy, sell, or trade information about computer hacking. So that could be your personal information acquired through a data breach. That could be denial of service attack where you knock a resource offline. And a variety of other hacking tools, malicious software, things like that. And then at the same time, there's been a rise in research around crypto markets. Basically, any forum or community where people can buy and sell goods via encrypted networks, mostly on Tor. So the hacker research has largely been open web, driven by anything that you can access via a forum or through your regular web browser, and in some cases through IRC or internet relay chat. But the rise of crypto market research is a little more novel. But the focus there is almost exclusively around drugs. There's one or two studies that look at firearms, but there's very little else considering what other products might be there. So there's a big question as to how much overlap exists, how many products that are in the dark web are being sold on the open web, and vice versa. And then more specifically, what are the common intersections of these markets? So if we think of hacking tools and data as a digital product, how do they converge with the physical goods like drugs or guns or other uh, sort of material objects that you can hold in your hand? Now, obviously, buying a credit card number or a hacking tool doesn't produce a physical commodity that needs to be shipped or delivered to the individual in a way that matches with, say, a gun or drugs. But the payment methods, the communications platforms, all those things could have points of intersectionality. And so our goal with this project has been to scope the size of the market, what kinds of categories are there, what are the quantities, what are the price points, but also how do they converge? So what are we seeing in terms of operational consistency between the types of markets that exist? And when some people hear crypto market or dark web or Tor, they may have a specific idea in mind. So this is an example of an ad that we've pulled down from one of our dark web vendors for hitmen services, basically contracted violence. And there's a range of these providers online. But the real question is how legitimate are they? 
You could ask the same thing really of any online vendor. How do I know that what I'm paying for is actually what's going to be delivered? Whether we're talking about personal information or drugs or guns or anything else. And so in the course of this project, we're also trying to map out avenues of trust. How do vendors and buyers know that they can rely on one another? This is not like, say, Amazon or eBay, where you have a formal complaint resolution mechanism at hand and you can go to your uh, payment service provider and say the product wasn't delivered. If we're talking about stolen credit cards, for instance, if you're buying a thousand personal credit card numbers, you probably don't want to call PayPal and say there's been a problem with the, the payment uh, that I delivered to this vendor. So we're, we're trying to understand a lot about how these mechanisms work. And if you're not familiar, there's kind of a specific language that's emerged in the academic literature, and to a lesser extent in the uh, cybersecurity literature as well. So there's these questions of open, deep, and dark. So when people talk about the open web, what they're really referring to is everything that you can access via your regular web browser. So that includes both what some people call the surface web and then the deep web. These are all the things that we can get to through Firefox or Chrome or some of the other browsers that are out there. The difference, though, between the surface and the deep web is that the surface web is everything that's been indexed by a search engine. So the cached Google history results that you get, or someone whose profile is available via Instagram or Facebook that comes up in those search results. The deep web, however, is everything that's behind a paywall or a password protection system or anything else that keeps a person from seeing the full contents. So these could be academic paywalls, journalistic ones, anything that limits access. The dark web, however, is a separate portion of the internet. So there are lots of different dark webs that are out there. It's basically encrypted communications operating via browser. So Tor is perhaps the most popular one that's out there, but there's also things like Freenet or I2P or some of these other services that are available. And the dark web requires a specific protocol and a tool to be used. The convenience with Tor is that it's all bundled together into a single download. So when you download Tor, it gives you a browser and a plugin and it manages all of the interface for you. So when people hear Tor, they may think it's this sophisticated tool. Really all it is is a, is a browser that you open and you're connected to Tor. It's nothing more complicated than that, at least on the surface. The deeper part, though, is what you don't see immediately. And that's how Tor works in terms of functionality. It routes your web traffic through other Tor users' systems, with the goal being to obfuscate your identity. So anyone who's using Tor, if you're going to Google to search for something specific, Google isn't going to register your computer here. It's going to assume you're the last hop in the chain. That has some implications for what you find. For instance, if you're going to Google through Tor, you may get French results or Dutch or German. It just depends because that last hop is going to be geographically specific. And so if you are going through a user in Germany, that's the output you're going to see. As the user, though, you don't have any necessary control over that process. It's totally randomized. And the value is that not only can you hide your web traffic behavior, but you can also host things via Tor. So you can set up a server in your basement, for instance, to host a web page on Tor. The challenge for law enforcement is that when we've got somebody who's operating a service like, say, one of these Hitman advertisements, you won't be able to look up this specific address. Uh, if you're familiar with something called Whois, it's how you look up the location and the IP address for a website. And you can't do that with Tor-based sites because of the encryption protocols. So it makes it harder for law enforcement to identify actors. Whereas with the open web, that can be done relatively easily. And it gives investigators the ability to triangulate between actors and get some sense of who's using legitimate services and who's using perhaps third-party, uh, what are called bulletproof hosting services. So there's a lot of variation, and there are reasons why someone would use Tor in order to connect, whether it's to anonymize, whether it's to hide, whether it's because you're engaged in illegal activity, or simply that you are interested in your own anonymity. But regardless, we've seen Tor become a platform for criminal activity. But the open web has historically been a platform as well. When we look at the open web, the difference has been, historically, they operate via forums. And a forum, if you're not familiar, is a set of threaded communications based around a given topic. So I can create a post, and that goes online, and then others can respond to my post and create a threaded conversation. 
And in the hacker community, forums have been a historically important resource, especially if you're engaged in cybercrime as a service, because it gives you the ability to advertise your goods and services directly to others. These little white circles that you're seeing pop up are different vendors for credit card numbers. So these are all different actors who we can go to for dumps, and dumps are basically credit or debit card numbers. So there's lots and lots of vendors for this. The complexity, though, is how do I, as the buyer, know who to trust? I mentioned that's a, that's a problem. If I've got multiple actors who I can buy from, do I go by price point? Do I go by reviews of products? What do I use to understand who's going to be legitimate? The space is getting even more complicated, though, because we're seeing this transition from forums, where you can read every thread and kind of get a sense of who's doing what and why and how much traffic they engage in, to a move toward what are called shops. And a shop is a single operator space. So unlike with a forum where I'm directly competing with everybody else, think of it like Amazon. You can have 50 different vendors for shoes all selling product through Amazon. A shop, however, is like that single operator space for a specific retailer. So if it's, for the purposes here, I'll say like Nike versus Adidas. They all have their own individual websites that you can go to to buy product. Or you can go to other retail sites as well. But when you go to their space, it's a little different. We're seeing the rise of shops in the underground economy as well. And a shop is a place where you are directly engaging only with one vendor. You don't have to see all that competition, and you can follow and uh, keep track of what the individual has to offer. And uh, this one looks like bingo. What it actually is is bin go. So that means bank identification number go. So if you want to buy dumps or credit card numbers, this vendor allows you to look up by specific bank or financial institution. And they're updating at the bottom, here's all the new stuff that we have as of this date. And in order to see their product, all you have to do is register with the site and uh, fill in a CAPTCHA and then you're good to go. So this competition between forum and shop is also something that requires some degree of investigation. So our project has been going through both the open web and the dark web and collecting as much as we can from different vendors, whether they're running shops, whether they're running forums. And so far, we've got over 180 different vendors in our sample with over 6,800 different product types. So that's a huge amount of material that's available. Our current data set is mostly focused around shops, and that's largely because we have so much information being sold in forums, it's taking us quite a bit of time to actually parse it all. So we have students who are directly reading all of this content and then inputting information about every specific product for sale. So it's a very labor-intensive project. We've gone through about, I think, 50 undergrads or so over the last uh, lifespan of the project. So it's been good experience for them to get a sense of how these criminal operations work. Initially, we did some of this via uh, sort of automated crawling, but we do a lot now via hand collection. So what that means is we have someone specifically go to the site, save all of the HTML pages that are there, and save everything in a single repository. So we can go back and historically analyze the content exactly as it appeared. And we also capture feedback. So I mentioned, how do you know who to trust? Surprisingly, like eBay or Amazon or other online platforms, you can actually populate it with information about your purchase. So others can know, oh yeah, this vendor actually delivers what they promise. Now, much like with Amazon and eBay, those systems can be gamed or sort of played out to, to falsify information, but it at least gives us a basis to understand what kinds of reviews are going through. And I'll go into the issue of feedback a little bit later on, but I just want to bring it up now as one of the things that we capture. So in total, given that we've got so much material available, our current primary categories of product are drugs, identity documents, and dumps. So drugs are about 40% of our total sample of products sold, followed by identity documents at about 18%. And then dumps come in at about 8% of the total. And dumps are those credit card numbers or debit card numbers that are for sale. What we're seeing as a whole is that whether we're talking about open web vendors or dark web vendors, they're almost all taking Bitcoin as their primary mode of payment. So uh, Bitcoin, if you're not familiar, is a type of cryptocurrency. So it's a way to encrypt end-to-end -end the payment that you're making to another vendor. 
Historically, with the hacker community, people were using open payment systems like PayPal. Uh, for a little while, Liberty Reserve and eGold were popular, even one called Web Money. But those have become more porous and more easy targets for law enforcement investigation. So Bitcoin is thought to be a little bit more of a protective feature to use if you want to minimize your risk of attribution. There are some exceptions, though. We do have some vendor products that take different kinds of payments. Uh, some of the bath salts vendors, for instance, will go outside of Bitcoin. Uh, same for uh, cocaine and K vendors. We have some uh, booter and stressor, basically hacker services, that also say that they'll take PayPal. But that's a much smaller quantity compared to everyone in our sample. One of the other things to note is that I mentioned this idea of trust. One way that vendors can develop trust is through taking escrow payments. What that means is that there is a person designated by the community to act as a middleman, and they will hold money in escrow for a buyer and seller until everyone is satisfied with the transaction as a means of guaranteeing trust. Because if I've never dealt with you before, but you say you take escrow, fine, I'll pay the extra 5% surcharge just to know if I don't get the product I've paid for, you won't get your money. So it ensures a degree of, of satisfaction. And it's amazing to watch how these illicit markets have developed their own ancillary systems of trust, given they know that they can't use formal dispute mechanisms to handle problems. Instead, they've come up with their own sort of set of formal and informal strategies. So thinking about the drug markets, we've got a range of different examples, but I'll show you some of our shops just to, to give you a sense of what the ads look like. So this is for Brain Magic Psychedelics. They sell uh, magic mushrooms, different types of psilocybin, and uh, other hallucinogens. And they break it out by uh, quantity, and so all their prices are in Bitcoin. That's why you see 0.013B. That means Bitcoin. And since Bitcoin pricing is variable to the day, uh, this is something that can change on the fly. Some of them will give you very clear uh, sort of calculation rates or exchange rates between the US dollar and Bitcoin, but it gives you an ability to process and understand how much you're paying in terms of quantity. And these buy now options are great because it's much like Amazon. If you've got an account with this uh, service provider, and you can see there's a register and a login system here, once you create your username and password and you put money into your account, you can just buy now until you've totally cashed out and then move on to the next type of transaction you want to engage in. Uh, then we have this one, the People's Drug Store. Uh, they sell a greater range of product, heroin, cocaine, ecstasy, speed. We do have some who specialize only in marijuana or others who only do cocaine, so there's a little bit of variability here. But that's one of the things we're trying to document now, is going through the individual vendors. Is their pricing differential based on specialty? So if I only sell marijuana, are my prices stable or different from those who are sort of multi-product vendors. So that's something we're trying to understand when it comes to these uh, underground economies. Does specialization matter? And uh, giving you a sense of price, this is how things currently break out for us. So we have marijuana as our top category with over 650 different ads, followed by opiates, which obviously are a huge concern right now, how opiates are getting into the US. Uh, certainly this is an avenue for delivery. Uh, but we do have ecstasy, MDMA. Um, steroids are also in here, and this is largely a function of our focus on both open and dark web vendors. Historically, a lot of the crypto market researchers only look at, say, one type of forum on the dark web. So we're going more broad, and as a result, we're capturing some variations that may not be present in some of the other academic literature. Uh, and as you can see here, cocaine is our most highest priced item relative to everything else on offer. And that makes sense. It's a slightly different type of drug. Uh, but this is something we're, we're examining a little bit more in depth. When it comes to communication, interestingly, most all of our drug vendors, since many of them are coming from the dark web, utilize encrypted emails as a means of communication. So they'll use things like ProtonMail or other services that encrypt the communication between both buyer and seller. That way, there's minimal degree of leakage to others outside. The exception, though, comes in with, say, Gmail. If you're using Gmail, that could be subpoenaed, that could be acquired, whereas with an encrypted email system like ProtonMail, it's a little harder to get into. In reading all the content of the ads, we also code for things like, uh, do they offer replacements? So in the event that the marijuana you've purchased is not of good quality or sufficient quality for your needs, you can ask for a replacement. 
75% uh, also operate some type of customer support. And I know that sounds unusual, but they will give you telegram or different means of connection. So if you're waiting on product and it isn't delivered, you have a way to get in touch with them, at least as quickly as is possible. And in terms of delivery, most of our vendors are shipping through either FedEx or uh, UPS, though we do have a small percentage that are using USPS, and it's thought that that's a higher risk point for delivery than some of the other options that are out there. Um, DHL is also a relatively small component given how many of these vendors are international. So this gives us some thought as to how we can uh, think about disruption through the existing supply chains. How do we improve identification of, say, illicit narcotics being shipped through our traditional streams of, of delivery? We also see the same thing though with identity documents and here there's slightly higher dependence on DHL. And with the identity document vendors, they're selling things like passports, driver's licenses, state IDs, and some will specify these are fraudulent. In other words, they will not likely get you through a, an airport or through passport control. But there are others that say these are legitimate. You can see our holograms. You can see everything that makes this a legitimate identity document. And some will even sell sort of identity packages. So you get a passport, a driver's license, and a social security card. So there's a, a degree of variation based on what you're interested in. And many of our vendors here are coming through the open web. And we think that's why many of them are using WhatsApp and Skype for instant communication as opposed to some of the encrypted applications that are out there. They're also more likely to use their own internal emailing systems. So they have their own website and they enable communication that way. So less dependence on the uh, sort of encrypted email communications compared to the drug vendors. And uh, as I mentioned, there's a lot of other uh, variation in terms of product that you can get here. The US is sort of the primary outlet for targeting, though. And uh, many will specify the range of states that they have available. So not only can you get US passports, but you can get state-specific identities as well. And uh, some will dig in a little bit and uh, also offer currencies, which sounds kind of strange, but they serve as sort of a one-stop hub for all things counterfeit paper. So whether that's passports, whether that's currency, um, interestingly, most of the quantities were around either 20s or 100s, and with euros, it's 10s or 50s. So there's a little bit of variation in terms of, of product there. But this will give you a sense of how things break out. This is one of our dark web counterfeit services. And you can see, again, they break everything into a Bitcoin pricing. So that little B there is, again, Bitcoin. And uh, you can see they have permanent residency visas here for Canada, US, Mexico. They've got higher pricing depending on what you want. Uh, and original identity cards, uh, you can see they say fully registered in a government database. Whether or not that's true, they're, they're at least claiming that to be the case. So this would be potentially a more legitimate vendor for uh, counterfeit products comparatively. And uh, then these are their currencies. So you can see, at least with some degree of accuracy, how much you're paying for quantities. So for instance, buying a 5,000 euro pack of euros is just under $1,000 US. So the, the pricing here is variable. This one, however, is an open web breakout. So whereas the last one was dark web, this is open web. So you can see some variations based on which platform you're working through. And uh, this is just a different kind of uh, counterfeiter here who offers counterfeit euros. We don't necessarily think this person is legitimate based on the sheer quantity of tags that they have in this. It may just be a way to drive people to their site, depending on how they've optimized uh, search engines. Or if you're familiar with the idea of SEO, how you bring people to your website, they're explicitly trying to get people here by having this huge lot of, uh, of tags for their products. So these are just some hallmarks that we can try to use to begin to square in around who's reliable and who isn't. Lastly, that gets us to our dumps vendors. So I mentioned we have people selling credit and debit card numbers. What's important here is that while we've got lots and lots of drug vendors, these dumps vendors are selling in such large quantity, they could arguably be the biggest category overall. And I'll show you why in just a second. But first, let me sort of break out how they're connecting. So here we're seeing far less dependence on the encrypted applications, and instead they're going mostly with ICQ, which comports with what we know historically about the hacker community. For some reason, they've always been big on ICQ, particularly in the Russian community. 
partially that may be due to the fact that you can create an ICQ profile that matches your existing phone number or your birth date or identity or, or other pieces of information so you can personalize and we think that may be part of why they're still using ICQ rather heavily. Uh, this also goes to some extent with the potential for subpoenaing communications since ICQ currently for a period of time has been operating out of Russia, so it's harder to get information from ICQ if you're looking for chat logs. But we do see some using Jabber as well, which is another type of instant messaging. Unlike with the first two products as well, there's no actual physical delivery of goods. Everything is an electronic dump, so we don't have to think about the same channels for delivery. But we see differentiation based on how they communicate. Um, here, for instance, many of the sites operate customer support and actually have a dedicated ticketing system. And I'll explain what that means in just a minute if you're having a problem. Uh, and they also have uh, product replacements similar to with drug dealers, only in this case they're, they're much more immediate in terms of delivery and turnaround. So. Um, We've tried a lot of different things to analyze the amount of product that's available. One way that we've tried to do this is by downloading the full vendor databases that are there. So in uh, just getting 12 instances of vendor data, we have over 1.6 million credit cards for sale. That's why I say if we just took this at the piece count level, there would be more cards than drugs for sale. And there's a lot of variation in terms of pricing here. So about $493 a card. But if you look at some of the individual listings, U.S. cards can go for as little as $3, in some cases $1. It really just depends on the vendor. So this is a reflection of global pricing influencing the, the overall cost of dumps. Our CVVs, that's the credit or debit card number plus the three-digit verification value on the back of the card or the four-digit number on the front of an American Express card. So that enables you to make instant transactions. These are a little cheaper than our dumps on average. We think this may be a function of risk where vendors are a little hesitant to sell these products en masse because it may lead to identification. So if they're getting them, they're trying to ship them quickly. And they also know people may use this as a, as a hot commodity. So if I'm not familiar with how to hack, but I know if I buy CVVs, I can just buy a TV right away or a bunch of Xboxes and have them shipped to me. Well, this is a great way to rip off people who are unfamiliar with the process. So, oh yeah, you can buy a 5,000 lot item of uh, CVVs from me and then never deliver anything. And as the bad guy, I've now got $5,000 of some young hacker's money and they have no way to get it back. So this is a, a product that we think may be aligned with potential uh, ripping off or, or cheating customers and the same for fulls. These are thought to be all information associated with an account. So there's differential risk based on the product lines here. And uh, to give you a sense of the breakdown, I mentioned we have this uh, 12 vendor database. Most of the states that are reflected here um, are what you might expect in terms of large population centers, Texas, New York, uh, Minnesota, North Carolina here as well. Um, Michigan is sort of lower tiered on the list, but we're seeing at least tens of thousands of cards in all of these instances. So there's huge amounts of data here. And if we blow this out to international levels, we can see information from Australia, all, all places around the world. So carding is, is definitely our, our problem space relative to everything else. What's interesting too about our Carter groups is they really emphasize this importance of trust. Uh, they use a lot of different language to try to demonstrate we are the vendor you should work with because we are more reliable than others. Uh, in this case, they're saying not only should you be able to trust us, we want to be able to trust you. If, if you're giving us money, we want to know that you're going to not get us in trouble. So there's a lot of weird language and sort of linguistic tricks that they use to demonstrate that they are reliable. And uh, as you can see at the bottom, they have a lot of different forms of communication that, uh, that they have at their disposal. And uh, this replacement time is also interesting. So if there's a problem with the dumps that you've bought, they'll replace them in five hours. If there's a problem with the CVVs, they claim a one hour turnaround. And how does that work exactly in practice? Well, since many of these are running through shops, once you create an account with the shop, this is what you see on the back end. They give you this very nice, very clean setup in terms of a uh, user interface. So they have a news tab, they have an FAQ, they have a tutorial even, and I'll show you some screen caps here from their tutorial. 
and they show you here's all the new cards that we have, here's the new information, here's the billings, here's the transactions that people are completing. And at the time that we were in this one, there's 216 active users at that point in time. So there's some degree of, of in and out within the community. And uh, this is similar to the drug market uh, ad that I showed you earlier. If you want to buy a specific card, you can populate money into your account and then do buy now. Or you can fill up your cart and then complete a sort of bulk transaction. It's up to you as to how you want that to flow. But what's important is that um, once you've inserted money into your account through Bitcoin, you'll have an, a balance with them and they even give you a nice little handy discount ticker. So here's how you keep track of how much you're buying and here's how much of a discount we're giving you because of the volumes you're buying in. One of the things that we're trying to do in building out these networks is getting different pieces of information like the Bitcoin wallets and the actual payment points that the vendors are using. So we can create a sort of back-end infrastructure of points of connection based on shared Bitcoin wallets or other points of communication that may suggest a vendor is actually using multiple online profiles to, to tie into one identity. So this is something we're, we're trying to look at a little more, the hidden networks within the communities. And uh, as I mentioned, they'll give you these sorts of Bitcoin converters so you know how much you're actually paying for your product in Bitcoin. And uh, they'll give you this nice sum calculator so you know exactly what you're paying and when. And uh, if you're a regular buyer, once you've completed a transaction, it goes to your order system. And if you're an extremely regular user, they even give you this promo code. So just like with regular e-commerce, they will push materials to you to keep you coming back for more. And that's a, a fascinating dynamic, the extent to which these shops are sort of replicating the traditional e-commerce platforms that are out there. It's, it's very interesting to see. So in the event that there's a problem, let's say this particular card that you've purchased isn't working, uh, so it's coming back invalid, you can click the refund tab on the order and it will populate a ticket in their system with a specific reference number, similar to uh, like IT tech support system ticketing. It's the same idea here. It gives you a direct reference to manage your product over time. So that, that kind of breaks out our top tier products, but we do see other types of products available. For instance, we do have a number of gun vendors in our sample, and they're selling at uh, a range of different prices. And um, there's a lot of different ways to sort of slice this particular pie of the market. But one thing that we're trying to do to better assess what's happening is to look at feedback. If feedback is a way to determine trust and accuracy between buyer and seller, one of the things that we can observe is that in a forum where there's more back and forth and engagement across multiple vendors at the same time, buyers have a greater capacity to influence seller reputation because everybody can see exactly what you've said at any point in time. But with the shops, all the examples I've shown you so far today are shops. Since the seller owns that space and operates it, they will indirectly allow you to see what buyers have experienced. If I'm a vendor and I've got five instances of negative feedback or lots of negative tickets in my system, why would I tell you as the potential buyer base I'm having problems? So there's an attempt to minimize the amount of negative information flowing out of our uh, shop vendors. And that's actually validated based on what we're seeing in terms of feedback. So we've quantified the amount of feedback we've seen so far. And arguably the least amount of negative feedback goes to our drug category. But we also have the lowest degree of positive feedback for dumps. So we're not sure if that actually means that uh, people just aren't populating the system with good information or if they're actually having more negative experiences and it's just not being shown publicly. Whereas with our drug vendors, there's a high degree of at least positive feedback given and the same for identity documents. So there are some inconsistencies we're trying to track across all the different product lines that we have. In fact, as I mentioned, we have 6,800 different product types and 26 distinct categories of product. So there's a whole host of things that, uh, that I haven't talked about here that I could. For instance, bulletproof hosting. So if I'm a, a malicious actor and I want to maintain a site over time and I don't want it to be taken down, say I'm hosting it on the open web, I can hire a service provider who may have infrastructure in Russia or China or certain parts of Southeast Asia, and I can use their services to ensure that my website isn't taken down. They'll handle all the hosting, they'll handle any mitigation, and they won't respond to takedown requests from law enforcement, where if they do, they'll quickly change the IP address and then put it right back up. 
So it minimizes the amount of downtime that any bad actor has. And uh, they run similar to these shops that we've seen for other infrastructure. Again, very nice GUIs, uh, a nice little ticketing interface, and buy now options. And this is actually for a, uh, an open web vendor who's very transparent in terms of their operations. We also see booter and stressor services. These are basically on-demand denial of service attacks. So I can knock down a website or a web server at my leisure. And many of these run through, uh, again, very simple to use interfaces. This is an example of one of them. So you can see how many attacks have occurred, uh, how many people are online at any given point in time. Uh, this one has over 10,000 registered users, though the amount of individuals online at any point in time is way below that amount. But it gives you a sense of, of how these distributions break out. But um, mentioning feedback and pricing with the gun community, one thing that we've noticed is that the pricing for firearms, since that's kind of an interesting category, is not that irregular from the overall market. And we're not seeing crazy items for sale here. For instance, it's not people selling AK-47s and high-grade military weaponry. Instead, it's mostly regular handguns or guns that you can acquire through legitimate markets. We're not sure if the distribution of these goods is because of European markets where there's sort of greater restriction on what you can buy, or if it's American vendors selling product, there's, there's a lot of gray area here that needs a little more exposition. And the same is true on pricing. When we've compared what we can find through a couple of different market vendors to the overall known price for different products, they're not that far over the overall market value. So buying through the dark web may be sensible for some product types, but not for all. So um, in general, one of the things that we're trying to understand by looking at this community is not only what's for sale and how many different products and all of that, but more broadly, how do we go through the process of takedown and disruption? So if a site can move or, or sort of spread quickly and taking out one group won't affect the whole, then what's the best way to deal with the overall market? Since uh, what we might refer to in criminological circles as displacement is very easy in an online space. In other words, I can move to another environment and purchase. Is the dark web just the alternative place to displace to? So if I traditionally go through open web providers, am I just going to move to Tor-based ones because there's less perceived risk? And then with the rise of shops, how is this going to impact the ability of law enforcement to disrupt the market? Whereas with a forum, taking down a forum may affect 50 or 100 different vendors. Removing one shop is just that. It's taking out one shop, period. So it doesn't have that great impact. So we're trying to think through some alternative strategies that might be out there. So one example, for instance, is the use of slander attacks. So feedback is an important avenue for information. What if you just start populating it with junk? Make the feedback mechanisms so unreliable that nobody wants to use them? Well, they may build their own. And so there's, there's sort of this cat and mouse as to how we deal with it. But the more we start to think creatively, the more we might actually be able to affect the market in different ways. A great example of this is the takedown of a group called Deep.Web. In the research community, Deep.Web was thought to be this excellent resource for information because you could go there and find out everything about new markets and persistent markets on the dark web. They would say updates every hour in some cases, depending on what was happening. And they seemed to have information about dark web operations before anyone else would. Come to find out, Deep.Web was actually getting money from some illicit vendors in Tor-based markets, and so they were thought to be facilitating criminal behavior. So the FBI was able to take down the site on the basis that they were laundering funds and enabling criminality. And so if we start to think more creatively and identify alternative avenues for disruption, this may be a fruitful way to affect the entire group. Because without deep.web, now there's got to be some other information mechanism that emerges. That downtime, uh, now it seems to be replaced by something called fail.io. But that's taken some time to stand up. So those kinds of things may at least take out portions of the market for periods of time. One other avenue might be to try to more creatively disrupt service providers. So myself and my colleague, Olga Smirnova at uh, Eastern Carolina, have been going through all of our open web providers and doing who is lookups, capturing as much information as we can about the service providers that enable the sites to persist over time. And we have a ton of vendors in the United States, but we don't have that much overlap. 
we have a smaller proportion who are operating out of Russia, and we see greater connectivity between those sites. And so it might be that these are illicit third-party actors who are clearly hosting malicious or illegal product and are doing so because they have a good reputation. So perhaps taking down these service providers may have a better effect overall, or at least affect small groups of actors concurrently. So this is some of the information that we're using to try to build out hidden networks. And uh, if you're interested in this, we have a white paper on our website now that sort of breaks out our preliminary findings around networks based on uh, who is lookups. So as a whole, the sort of takeaways from today, a lot of what we found support what's generally out there in terms of dark web operations. Drugs are our sort of greatest quantity, particularly around marijuana, and that supports a lot of research especially out of Canadian and uh, Australian crypto market researchers. But the amount of opiates that are there is, is somewhat interesting as well. Um, what hasn't been seen really in the literature, though, are the identity documents and the currencies. Most people have focused either on hacking tools or drugs. And we're seeing there's actually sort of this middle ground that may be important. Uh, if you're trying to, say, cash out the cards that you've purchased, having a fake identity on hand is very important. Same is true of, say, your accepting or shipping or you're in some way acting as an intermediary for drug vendors, if you've got a fake identity to hand to someone in the event that you need it, that's a, a pretty handy thing to have on hand. So this could be an important facilitator. And as I mentioned uh, with the dumps, while it's the low category compared to everything else, if we just look at the piece counts, they are way above everything else. So we can't ignore dumps even though they're a smaller representation in our sample just based on that category. Additionally, when we look at the intersectionality of the market, we see Bitcoin as the real point of connection. So many vendors are taking Bitcoin, regardless of whether they're selling a physical good or a digital good. The difference, though, is when we start digging in and looking at some of the comms platforms. Uh, there are some distinct differences in how the groups are communicating. Uh, there's a little bit of consistency, though, on physical good delivery. So the use of DHL or at least some of the common shipping lanes. So we might be able to use that to affect operations. And the same is true with that sort of open web footprinting. How do we use that information to better disrupt the market? But there's a lot more that we still have to do. So we're trying to create our sort of buckets within the economy and say, here's how many transactions we think have occurred. Here's sort of the average pricing. Here's the distributions of goods. And then why might these distributions be present? Is it a difference in terms of how the goods are sold or, say, a dark web versus open web comparison? We're also building those social networks, as I mentioned. And um, we're putting out a lot of briefs now that we're sort of nearing the end of our life cycle for data collection. We're really digging into analysis. So if anything that I've had to talk about today is of interest, you can visit our website here, cj.msu.edu, at uh, programs at SENA. We've got one or two page PDF briefs explaining our findings. We also are going to do some webinars in the next six months that will be open to the public. So if you want to learn more about specific product lines, for instance, um, we have an analysis of our Hitman providers uh, that will be coming up soon. Um, we're going to do another one around the drugs and another one around the identity document side. So we'll, we'll dig in a little more depth in those for, for specificity's sake. But um, let me go ahead and open it up to questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.